What's happening in the Arctic over climate change? Well, it seems to me this shouldn't be a difficult question to answer. How much is the temperature rising? How much is the sea ice melting? We might argue about how it will go in the future and what will be the knock-on effects, but those things at least should be easy to answer. Right? And yet, I keep seeing flatly contradictory claims about the very basics. I figured it was time to take a closer look and discover what's actually going on. I go into this with the understanding that the temperatures in the Arctic have been rising faster with climate change than the rest of the globe, which is what we're told. Indeed, that was the key rationale for the recent phenomenon of global stilling, where wind speeds in Europe have been declining because the temperature difference between the pole and the equator becomes less because the pole is warming faster than the equator. So I didn't think that phenomenon was controversial. And if it's warming faster in the Arctic, you would naturally expect that that would play out in terms of a decline in sea ice. These systems are often more complex than you expect, but generally more heat means less ice. So let's first of all check that this is as we expect. First of all, is it true that the Arctic is warming? This graph shows one of the key climate datasets, HADCRUT4, from the Climatic Research Unit, made up of ground-level temperature monitoring stations. Temperatures from 70 to 90 degrees north, and we can see the warming temperatures over the recent period. The graph is temperature difference compared to the average for the period 1961 to 1990. Then we check that against the satellite UAH measurements of the lower atmosphere for 60 to 85 degrees north, taken by Roy Spencer and John Christie, names familiar to the sceptic community. Again, a clear increase, slightly less pronounced. Then there's the other satellite system, remote sensing systems, for the area 60 to 82.5 degrees north a more pronounced increase from that data set. And then we can just cross-reference with a few individual stations on the ground. Fairbanks and Nook at 64 degrees north, Svalbard at 78 degrees, and Ostrov Dixon at 73 degrees. And you can see that, generally speaking, in this very small sample, the stations further north are seeing the most pronounced increases. These are annual averages. The Danish Meteorological Institute has broken these down further for the northernmost part, 80 degrees north plus, into seasons. And it shows that the winter mean has been rising strongly, even as the summer mean has remained rather flat. Spring and autumn both also show a strong increase. The DMI does caution that these graphs shouldn't be taken as accurate climate trends because of how they're measured, but they do reflect the fact that Arctic winter temperatures in particular have been up to 8 degrees warmer in recent years. So there are not huge numbers of measuring stations across the Arctic, not like you'd get across Europe or North America. It was particularly low in the early part of the 20th century, with more being added after 1923 and 1933. But nevertheless, enough correlation between all of those systems to support the contention that yes, the Arctic has been warming. And we would intuitively expect that means a reduction in sea ice, probably in the Greenland ice sheet as well. Not going to go into that in this video. Sea ice thickness is hard to measure, so observations are somewhat sparse. Using the ocean and sea ice model Pyomass, this animation was produced showing October sea ice thickness and volume from 1979 to 2021. It starts with a sea ice volume of 17,854 cubic kilometres. It ends with 6,138. In this separate animation by NASA Goddard, you see a similar representation where you can clearly see the old, thicker ice and how even as the winter months bring new ice, the extent of that older, thicker ice is significantly reduced. Animations are all very pretty, but what proper data can we get? The National Snow and Ice Data Centre produces this graph of the sea ice extent from November 1978 when satellite measurement was first introduced to the present. This is for the Northern Hemisphere. Different graphs will sometimes define different parts of the Arctic, so you have to beware of that before making comparisons. Let's look as well at the centre's graph for the Arctic sea ice extent, specifically for September. 
which is the month when summer ice melt has generally hit its peak before the freeze comes back into play. As you can see, that trend line is reasonably clear over the 40-year period, but with some strong year-to-year -year variability. A very low ice extent in 2012, which hasn't been matched since. So all of that seems clear. But we know that there are alternative critiques that suggest that the situation is very different. So what's the nature of those critiques? Are they well founded? Have they found some evidence that we haven't yet covered? One of them comes from Paul Homewood at the No Trick Zone Climate Skeptic blog and it draws a different conclusion to that last graph that I just showed. It is very easy to show that Arctic sea ice has stabilised, he says. As their graph itself shows, there have only been three years since 2007 with lower ice extent than that year, and 11 have had higher extents. Also, the average of the last 10 years is higher than 2007's extent. As the blogger Tamino pointed out, his argument is that the graph should really be understood like this. Now that's something of a stretch. It's a rather short period at the end there to be arguing that it's delineating a new trend, which, to be fair, he himself admits, in itself, this is too short a period to make any meaningful judgments, but that is no excuse for the Met Office to publish such a manifest falsehood. Well, which is it? Is it evidence that the ice has stabilised, as he said in the previous paragraph, or is it too short a period to make any meaningful judgment, as he says in the second? Well, look, that specific graph tells us the minimum ice extent for each year, which is just one day. So suppose we look instead at the average ice extent for each year. And let's see if that gives us any better insights. Tamino ran the data for that graph, which came out like this. And you'd have to say that seems like a pretty clear trend. The NSIDC published an update on this year's season, noting the summer melt season has come to a modest end. The summer of 2021 was relatively cool compared to the most recent years, and September extent was the highest since 2014. It didn't impact the multi-year ice, which has reached a record low, but otherwise the extent was larger. In the context of that graph, it's just a description of the latest twist of ongoing variability, which is clearly visible. However, some of the climate sceptics seem to get very excited by short-term weather, publishing numerous posts about how cold it is today in the Arctic, which they seem to think proves something. Now, to be fair, they're not the only ones who jump onto short-term weather events in order to make a point. The Extinction Rebellion types do exactly the same with every heat wave or other weather anomaly that comes along. And it's just as dumb when they do it. Some of the others come up with a ridiculous straw man proposition that rely on your believing in a cartoon-level travesty of climate science. So, for instance, Tony Heller, who presents his straw man like this. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says that July was the hottest month ever recorded. Global warming theory says that the poles should warm much faster than the rest of the planet, and experts tell us that the poles are melting very quickly. If July was the hottest month on record, then the North Pole must have been very warm, and ice at both poles must be melting at record rates. But of course no scientist and no research has ever suggested that if the global average temperature is at its highest, that necessarily means that a specific geographical location can't be having colder weather at that point. If you look at the complexity of how climate and weather works, you'd have to be a complete idiot to conclude that that's the case. But Helen needs you to believe that the other side argue complete idiotic things, because then he can show you that they're not true. How else can he persuade his followers that he uses data and facts while proving that things are false that people never actually said in the first place? He also has history on his side, of course, because he has an account on newspapers.com and he knows how to use it, or misuse it anyway. So, for instance, he makes this claim. In 1958, a United States submarine surfaced at an ice-free North Pole. The USS Skate, he said, surfaced in 1958 at, quote, an ice-free North Pole. And he shows a historical photograph, which he implies shows that event. But the clip doesn't claim that the photograph is a record of the event. It's just a photograph of the submarine in question. 
the idea that it's sometimes been warmer at the poles and there have been other times when people have observed and commented on ice melt in the Arctic. That's pretty unremarkable in line with research. You'd have to believe the straw man version of climate science to think that that's strange. But this specific claim of an ice-free North Pole in 1958, that goes above and beyond that. So is that true? Well, not according to National Geographic magazine, which related the event of that submarine like this. The winter sun still hid below the horizon last March 17, when USS Skate crunched up through the ice at 90 degrees north, first ship in history ever to surface at the pole. Crunching up through the ice doesn't sound like a process you need to do when the North Pole is ice-free. And that confirms that Heller's photo is not from that event. A fact that's reinforced by Life magazine's May 1959 edition. Shout out to the Great White Con blog for linking to that. Which shows a photo taken by one of two men who were deposited onto the ice to record the process of surfacing. This actually took place some way away from the North Pole where the ice was thinner. The actual narrative about the pole explains that it was a lot tougher there. On March 17, we arrived in the vicinity of the geographic North Pole. But as we cruised back and forth in the darkness below the pole, no frozen leads or polynyas appeared. Then suddenly we spotted the faint light of a small lead and we started up. This was our toughest surfacing so far. The quarters were cramped and we had to take special care not to hit Skate's delicate rudder against the walls of ice. It took us two hours of careful manoeuvring before Skate's sail buckled the ice at the precise top of the world. Climbing to the bridge, I was greeted by an awesome sight. Skate was in a small lead completely surrounded by ten foot high hummocks of ice. Doesn't sound like an ice-free North Pole, does it? Ultimately, though, we shouldn't be relying on anecdotes if we have data. And luckily, in 1958, the USS Nautilus carried out acoustic under-ice thickness monitoring, a process which was then repeated by another vessel in 1970. The Nautilus found the ice thickness mean to be 5.32 metres. So much for the anecdotes and the misrepresented news clips. However, there is a graph that I've seen a lot and looks more credible and tells a completely different story. And it's this one, the Maisie Sea Ice Extent Graph. It's a particular favourite of Heller's, and although it only runs from 2006, which isn't a long time for a climate trend, it's pretty compelling in terms of the apparent lack of change year to year. There's an alternative version that just picks a single month from the cycle, for instance this one, Maisie itself doesn't produce graphs in this form. This has been done from the data they provide by climate sceptics. You might wonder why they don't do it themselves. We'll come to that in a moment. But in any case, both of those graphs are completely in contradiction to the ice extinct graphs we've seen so far. So one version at least must be wrong. Bearing in mind the satellite data goes back significantly further, it's not obvious why you would start with a version that begins only in 2006. If you go to the Maisie site, you find that it's not intended to be used as a reliable measure of year-on-year -year sea ice trends. It says it is an operational product. Operational ice charts meet the needs of those going into the ice and provide general situational awareness such as the extent of fast ice or of ice of any concentration greater than 0%. Chart production is more flexible than is IMS production in order to meet changing user needs and source data availability. That flexibility mitigates against year-on-year -year comparisons. Indeed, Maisie says outright, don't use this data for trends, which is presumably why they don't produce those graphs themselves. While operational analyses are usually the most accurate and timely representation of sea ice, they have errors and biases that change over time. If one is interested in long-term trends in sea ice or how it responds to changing climate forcing, generally it is best not to use an operational product, but rather one that is consistently produced and retroactively quality controlled. 
the NSIDC Sea Ice Index Monthly Ice Extent and the satellite passive microwave datasets upon which it's based is one example. In other words, we've seen measures that show the sea ice is declining, then we see MAISI apparently not and the creators of the MAISI data explicitly say don't use this for trends, use those other measures. There are other reconstructions of the sea ice extent in the literature. Here are some of the key ones. Walsh summer extents, significant decline. Pieron and Pasalodos, 2016, September extent, significant decline. Alexev et al, September extent, that one stands out for being more uneven, showing an equivalent decline in the 1920s and 1930s. The CMIP5 computer modelled September extents, significant decline. And then another one by climate sceptics, Donnelly, Donnelly and Soon, showing decline, albeit at a slightly less steep rate. But what about that aberrant one in the middle, Alexeyev et al? It won't entirely astonish you to discover that that one has appeared several times in climate sceptic blogs. Not the others, you understand, just that one. What they don't mention is that the, in the paper itself, the authors predict an ice-free Arctic summer by 2030. So even with the suggested deeper reduction early 20th century, the authors weren't seeing that as a disproval of what we know about current trends. Indeed, they were predicting it to the more extreme early end. The sceptics are usually, not always, but usually on firmer footing when they restrict themselves to laughing at people who are unwise enough to make predictions of imminent change, assuming that they're quoting the predictions accurately, which is not always the case, such as Professor Peter Wadhams, for instance, who said that the summer Arctic would be free of ice by 2020, regardless of the fact that this was more than 20 years ahead of the most pessimistic of the models. The definition of ice-free, by the way, is not that there'd be no ice, as you might reasonably intuit, but that it would be broken up enough that a ship could push through it. Interestingly, the newspaper story on this one included this passage. Wadhams' pronouncement was angrily challenged by one of the scientists modelling sea ice decline. In reply, Wadhams was snippy about the fact he was using data, which is better than models. A sentiment I know that a few of the viewers of this channel tend to support, albeit from the opposite perspective. But he was clearly wrong in his certainty. And this is just another example of the reality that the research has to show its workings out, but the opinions of individual scientists are, at the end of the day, just opinions. Especially when it comes to predicting the future, which is actually really hard. To be fair, it wasn't such an unreasonable speculation. As you can see from the sea ice decline, around the time we made it in 2014, there had been a period when the decline was particularly pronounced. This paper by Overland and Wang in 2013 noted that recent observations had not been in line with model projections of an ice-free summer Arctic by 2070. It noted three approaches to predictions in the scientific literature, one extrapolation of sea ice volume data, two assuming several more rapid loss events such as 2007 and 2012, and three climate model projections. Time horizons for a nearly sea ice-free summer for these three approaches are roughly 2020 or earlier, 2030 plus or minus 10 years, and 2040 or later. It noted that Wadhams' approach, which it labels as direct extrapolation of sea ice volume by trendsetters, may be minimising the potential effects of year-to-year -year variability, which we can see now must have been the case, although by how much remains an open question, because... Did I mention already? Predicting the future is hard. What seems to be pretty solid, of course, is all the evidence pointing to the direction of travel and the inevitable end point. So there may be innocent fun to be had in mocking the unwise, who proclaim certainty on an early specified date. But it's only that interesting if you accept the implied narrative that the people making the predictions are purely shooting in the dark and the real world isn't following that path at all but the evidence suggests that it actually is. If someone predicted something for 2016 that eventually came along in 2026 or 2036, as his colleagues had predicted, it's not that interesting, is it? You might hold it to be more interesting 
if you believe what some of the climate campaigners suggest, which is that the arrival of an ice-free Arctic summer will signal a catastrophic tipping point. This blog post is typical of the genre. The blue ocean event will be a tipping point for our climate. Climatology says it will crush humanity like a bug. This is the opinion of Paul Beckwith. Although, looking to the source of his comment, he's remarkably vague about the mechanism for said crushing. The IPCC AR5 report concluded that although some earlier studies had supported the idea of a tipping point, there really wasn't much evidence for it in the more recent studies, either from global climate models or from specific sea ice models. That doesn't mean there's no impact. The less ice cover, the more the sun's energy is absorbed rather than being reflected, and the more global warming is boosted. But no, not the imminent human crushing emergency that some would hold as far as the research can determine. So what do we get from all of this? For me, it's a sense of surrealism. But at this point, there should be a debate in principle as to whether or not the Arctic is warming and whether or not the sea ice is melting. There are climate sceptics such as Lomborg and Schellenberger who ask pertinent questions about climate policy choices who don't dispute the reality of that sort of change in order to do it. And even some of those who attract the deep scorn of the climate scientists, rightly or wrongly, such as the Connolly brothers and Willie Soon, do not dispute the direction of travel as far as I've seen. Whether they have something to contribute or not, they're clearly not the same animal as the out-and-out fantasists who simply say, it's not happening. The figures are faked. Here's some out-of-context historical junk that contradicts what nobody ever said in the first place. The real world does not wait for such delusions to be dispelled. Russia, China and the US are currently in a very real geopolitical struggle because the melting of Arctic ice is opening up potentially valuable trade routes. Weirdly, they didn't get the memo that it was all just made up for whatever flimsy justification the fantasists can concoct. Oh, it's climate scientists chasing grants, I sometimes hear. Well, there's a lot more money than that hinging on these new trade routes, which could take 20 days off the 48 days it currently takes to get to Rotterdam from China via the Suez Canal. Not to mention the access it will give to oil and gas, minerals, fishing and other resources in the region. But no, Tony Heller says it's all made up and the ice is as thick as it's always been. And how the Chinese and the Russians will laugh when they find out how they were taken in. Or you can choose to live in the real world, where you work out what's happening based on what the data says, not on what you'd prefer it said. And sometimes things happen that are not so immediately intuitive that you can just predict how it's going to go. So, for instance, I did a video recently about the Arctic phenomenon, which means that global warming can actually result in severe colder weather and why that happens. If you've watched this video, you might be interested to watch that one next.